in this internet gospel meeting. I want to take a few minutes today of your time and share something with you that initially might seem shocking to you. And somebody says, well, how, how could it, how could something be shocking from a, from a gospel meeting video or lesson from the Bible? I want to talk about five things that God does not know. Somebody says, well, God knows everything. How can you talk about anything that God does not know? Much less five things that God doesn't know. Preacher, are you sure about that? Well, when we get into the lesson, I think you'll understand the, the value of the illustration and the real point we're trying to make. Now, one thing is very clear. When you read Psalm 139, for example, David wrote this psalm and he was talking about how God knew everything about him. He knew where he went. He knew where he was at all times. He says in verse 1, of Psalm 139, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. And then David goes on to talk about no matter where he goes, you're there. And the idea from Psalm 139 is that God some people say he's omnipresent. I really think the emphasis of this psalm is God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. So somebody says, how do you say, preacher, that there are five things that God does not know? Well, let's, let's think about it and learn something about God that you might be surprised at. There was a little boy who... Uh, was going on vacation with his family. And he, and he was a small guy, you know, a little guy, um, still young. And, and so as he walked out of the house, he said, goodbye house. And uh, he walked by the chair, his chair in the living room, he said, goodbye chair. You know, like a little guy might do. And they got in the car and he drove, they drove away. And little boy looked back at the house. He said, Goodbye house, and finally they went by the church building. He looked over the church building and he said, goodbye, God. Well, that's a child's mind for you. It really doesn't work that way. We can't say goodbye, God. We might deny God and, and say goodbye to him, but God is, God is. The Bible begins by saying in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just think about it, that God has always been, and he always will be, and he is omniscient. He knows everything, but I want to think about some things that God does not know. Somebody says, now, wait a minute. God knows things. You, you can't be saying God doesn't know anything, because I read in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 that God knows what you need before you ask him. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, the Bible says the very hairs of your head are all numbered, and God knows that. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, the Bible says God knows, and the Lord knows those who are his. And so how can you say God doesn't know some things? Hebrews 4.13 says there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And somebody says, you see, God knows all these things. Well, let's illustrate what we're talking about. I'm kind of speaking from a different slant. And I hope that what we're going to study together today will be helpful to you. Number one, God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner, number two, that he does not love. Number three, God does not know a sinner that he does not want to be saved. Number four, God does not know a better way to save mankind than the plan that he has provided. And God does not know a better time for a person to be saved than now. 
So maybe now you see how we could say there are five things that God does not know. Think about it this way. I hope you have your Bible uh, as you watch this. Uh, I'm going to use mine, and I hope you get yours and follow along. God does not know a sin. He does not hate. There are things that are baffling to some people. For example, in, in the Garden of Eden, how did a serpent speak to Mother Eve? And they get all hung up on how, how could a snake talk to Mother Eve? And, and that's just a fairy tale. I really don't know how the devil did that. I know it was the devil who was speaking through that serpent. Here's the main point. Let's set aside that part and realize that God had given a command to Adam in Genesis chapter two, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In chapter three, after God has made Eve and given her to Adam, the devil comes to her in the form of a serpent and he says, has God said you should not eat of every tree that's in the garden? And and Eve says, and I'm paraphrasing, well, we can eat from any tree that's in the garden, except for there's one tree, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has said that you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. In Genesis 3 and verse 4, the devil says, you will not surely die. He lied. He lied to Mother Eve. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle Paul would say that Eve was deceived. Adam also took the fruit and he ate of it and they died. Paul would also say in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2 that Adam was not deceived. He clearly understood the command. The devil tricked Eve. The devil works in two ways. Number one, he lies, but the way he works is he will convince somebody who knows better to do something, then he'll deceive somebody by making it sound like God didn't tell you the truth or it's really not that bad or you know nothing really bad is going to come from this. And so why does God hate sin? Why is there no sin that God does not hate? Because sin separated Adam and Eve from God. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 12 that through one man, sin entered the world and death sin, death through sin, and uh, all died because all sin. Well, how did sin enter the world? How did death enter the world? Sin entered the world. Death entered the world through sin. What is death? It simply means separation. The soul is separated from the body. Spiritually, the soul is separated from God. And God had told them, had told Eve, Adam and Adam to Eve, you, the day you eat that fruit, you will surely die. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 and following, the Bible talks about six things that God hates and seven are abomination to him. There are six things which the Lord hates. So the Lord hates these sins. He hates haughty eyes. It's an arrogant person, very arrogant look. He hates a lying tongue. What else does he hate? Hands that shed innocent blood, people that take the lives of innocent individuals, like little babies that are unborn, or even adults, or, or anyone for that matter. They, he hates that. And he hates hearts that devise wicked plans. He hates what's going on in your heart if it's wicked. He hates feet that run rapidly to do evil. He hates a false witness, one who would give a false testimony about someone, who utters lies, one who spreads strife among brothers. And, and so there's, God hates sin. He hates these things. And for one, sin separates man from God. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that the Lord's hand is not short and that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin is very serious. Spiritual death, separation from God, 
and you read these things from Proverbs chapter six, sin causes trouble between individuals. It causes strife. It causes people to hate one another. Sin causes the calamities, calamities in life. What is sin anyway? In the New Testament, the beloved old apostle John said in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that sin is transgression of God's law. That is, another translation says sin is lawlessness. It's like living without law. When I was a little boy, I used to watch uh, cowboy shows. And my dad would say, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. And he'd say, Roger, the bad guys are outlaws. What does that mean, Daddy? They live outside the law. They do whatever they want to do. They violate the law of man. Sin is a violation of the law of God. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned. In Romans 6 and verse 23, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. God hates sin because it causes spiritual death, separation between man and God. It causes problems between individuals, and it will cause people to be lost. It brought death into the world. And, and so what about that one sin? Go back and read Genesis 3, and one sin and all the trouble that it caused. And it caused Adam and Eve to, to be driven from their beautiful, wonderful paradise, garden home where everything was great till the devil came along and convinced them to sin. God didn't want them to sin. God wanted them to honor him and do what he said. I've often wondered what kind of conversation did Adam and Eve have on the way out of the garden? I can just imagine they were human beings. Uh, why did you do that? Do you see the trouble you've caused? Can you imagine the, the, the fight they might've had? Now the Bible doesn't say, but we know how people are. They, they would have been, had some contention and sin came into the world. You know, God calls sin spiritual death, or at least the consequences of it. Romans 6 and verse 23, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. In Romans 3, 23, the Bible says all of sin. I remember some years ago, I was listening to a radio program uh, and a man was preaching on the radio, and and they, I don't know exactly everything was being said, but a caller called in and said, and so the, the preacher answered the phone, and and the, the person on the other end of the line said, I want to tell you something, preacher, I don't sin. Well, I don't know what their per that person's idea was of sin, but the preacher was very clear to explain to them, the Bible says you have, and the Bible says you do. God hates sin because it separates us from him and it causes trouble in life. And if it's not covered with the blood of Jesus, it will keep us out of heaven. It'll cause us to go to hell. Secondly, however, there is not, God does not know a sinner that he does not love. Now, we have a lot of people in this world that we probably have a hard time loving. As a matter of fact, there's some people in this world that say, I don't love those people at all. I, I just can't deal with it. Uh, the, these people that do these school shootings and somebody go in there and kill all those children or and then those who abort unborn babies, I just can't deal with that. There's something wrong with their heart. I think about all of the world leaders over time. If you go back and know your history, who've been violent people, take people's lives without any thought just to conquer a new land or to exert their power because they had some kind of uh, ego problem. And, and so they just kill people. I think about abusive parents, that the parents uh, that would abuse a little child and, and to the ultimate degree. I think about Jeffrey Dahmer back Mm, between 1978 and 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered 17 men. He, he was weird. And that's an awful thing he did. And he got put in prison for it. Did you know that when Jeffrey Dahmer was in prison, he was taught the gospel and was baptized into Christ? Later, he was killed. Did God love Jeffrey Dahmer? Sure he did. 
does did God does God love when he was able to respond people like Genghis Khan or or the the people during the Vietnam War that would booby trap their children to to fight a battle or go back to Adolf Hitler or all the world struggles that are going on now, people just bombing and killing. Uh, does God love the person who will lie to get into a political position? Now, this is, I'm not saying God approves of their behavior. You see, there's something about man that separates man from the animal kingdom. When God created man, the animal kingdom in Genesis chapter one, verse 18, everything was good. Uh, but when he got through making man who was made in his image and his likeness, it was very good. See, a man has a soul. There's something internally, spiritually different between us and the finest animal you've ever had as a pet or the most expensive racehorse ever or, or whatever kind of animal. You're special. If you're a human being, you're special to God. And I think about some of these people, like Saul of Tarsus, even in 1 Timothy 1, verse 13. That man, if you go back and read the seventh chapter of Acts, you see him standing there and, and watching one of God's preachers named Stephen get stoned, just stoned to death. Stoned him to death for preaching the gospel. And the people laid Stephen's garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Later, Saul was converted to become a Christian and apostle for Jesus to the Gentile people. But, but Paul, Paul or he was Saul of Tarsus at that time. And we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, all Saul of Tarsus at that time, Paul here talked about himself. I was a blasphemer. That means to speak against God. I was a persecutor. He persecuted Stephen and the church later. And the Bible says, he says of himself, a violent aggressor. You mean to tell me God loves what he did? No, he didn't love what Saul did, but he loved him because he had a soul. He said, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. You see, God wants to show mercy on everybody. The people who do the worst things or the people who maybe not do the worst things and don't say you don't sin. Well, I don't murder people. I've been faithful to my spouse for all these years and, and I go to, you know, I, I'm a good person. And, and yet the Bible says all have sinned. Did Jesus die for you? So much, well, yes, he died for me. Then why did he die for you? First Corinthians 15 and verse three, the Bible says Christ died for our sins. Who sins? All people's sins. The worst sinful people to those who may sin a little, but all sin separates man from God. And Paul says that he was shown mercy. Why? Because God loved him. See, God knew he could, if he could convert Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the Apostle, he could rechannel that, that dedication and that devotion and that energy by sharing the gospel. And he was right about that man. Now, God hates sin. God hates sin because of its destructive power. But he loves the sinner. You know, Jesus got in trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees during his ministry because he would eat with sinners. They felt themselves above everybody else. That's why I don't want to be called a Pharisee because they thought they were better than everybody and they thought they didn't sin. But Jesus, by, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Now, Jesus didn't run around with sinful people to be like them. The Bible says in Luke 19 and verse 10, in the context of Zacchaeus, who was looking for Jesus up in a tree and Jesus went on with him, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, why, did, why did Jesus eat with sinners? Because they were lost. 
Why did Jesus preach to the scribes and the Pharisees too? Because they too were lost, even though they didn't admit it, they too were lost. You see, there's not a, there's not a person that God does not love. And in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, it's one of the records of Jesus' conversation with a rich young ruler. And, and the Bible says in verse 21 that Jesus, looking at that young man, loved him. Mark is the only uh, Mark is the only one who said that. Uh, it doesn't mean that he loved what he was doing. This young man was rich, filthy rich, possessor of lands. He wanted to know what one good thing he could do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, "Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll lay up treasure in heaven, and come follow me." Unfortunately, he went away sad, he went away grieving. He couldn't do what Jesus demanded, but the Bible says Jesus loved him. He didn't love Jesus. He loved his things more than he did God, and he loved his things more than he did people. So he went away sorrowful, but God still loved him. Jesus told him the truth. You know, the, a real gospel preacher and teacher will tell people the truth. Um, we should do it in love, Ephesians 4, 15, but still be straight about it. This is what God says, because if you lie to them, that's not love. If you tell them something God did not say, that's not love. But God loves a sinner enough to tell the sinner the truth. You know, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, it's, these are a couple of verses here that are some of my favorites that Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Rome. In verse 6 of Romans chapter 5, the apostle said, For while we were still helpless, weak, without strength, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I have to ask, did he die for you? Did he die for me? Did he die for Genghis Khan? Did he die for Jeffrey Dahmer? Did he die later for the rich young ruler? Did he die for Vladimir Putin? The Russians? Did he die for people that in communist countries that want to control everybody? Did he die for our president? Did he die for you, your wife, your children? Jesus died for everybody. The Bible says we were helpless. What does that mean? Well, we've sinned, but there's really nothing we could do about our sin situation. You can't be good enough to make up for it. So God had to send his son to pay the price. In Romans 5, in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for everybody. Jesus hopes, and Paul would hope as he wrote this, that everybody would appreciate what Jesus did to realize that God loves them. I don't know if anybody else in this world loves you or not. There may be not many, there may not be any that you know of. I'm going to tell you this, as a Christian, I love you. I love your soul or I wouldn't be talking about this. But God loves you far greater than I ever could. He loves us. While we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were ungodly, Christ died. In verse 9 of Romans 5, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, Paul wrote that to people who are already Christians. But if a person wants to be a Christian, you too can be justified by his blood and saved from the wrath of God. And that's an interesting point that Paul makes. God is love. God loves people. But there's the wrathful side of God, that side of God that if people refuse to listen to what he says, they will suffer his wrath for eternity. But you see, God loved us so much. He says, I'm going to give you my son. And I'll send him and let him die for you. Will you give your life to him and live for him? You remember Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell your possessions, give to the poor. You'll lay up treasure in heaven and come Follow me. Richard really couldn't do it. I have a question. Will you follow Jesus? 
He loves you. He loves you more than you know. God does not know a sinner that he does not want to save. God does not know a sin he does not hate. He does not know a sinner that he does not love. He does not know a sinner that he does not want to save. There are, there are a certain group of people who teach that, well, there are only certain people that were before, before the foundation of the world, God decided who would be saved and who would be lost. Before the foundation of the world, God knew who would be saved and he knew who would be lost, but he did not make that decision. We make that decision. We choose whether we want to follow Jesus or not. And it's a classic illustration. The rich young ruler, Jesus told him, if you'll sell your possessions and help people and, and you, you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me, you can have eternal life. It was not predetermined by God that that young ruler make the decision to turn around and walk off. That was his decision alone. And it's that way with everybody. What kind of God predetermines our destination and we have no choice in the matter? That's not a God of love. It's not a God of justice. It's not a God of fairness. Who, who, can, who can God save then? Somebody asks the question. To argue that God, as some have said, is trying to do his best to save all mankind, but that the majority of men will not let him save them is to insist that the will of the creator is all powerful and that the creature is omnipotent. Let me read that again. To argue that God, he's trying to save people, but the majority won't let him do it, is insisting that God's power is, 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 God is powerless and man has all the power. Well, that's not true. God's not powerless. We have the power to choose, but God's not powerless. But we do choose. You remember, perhaps, I don't know if you've ever read this, but John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus and he was out preaching and he, he saw a group of people uh, he was preaching to it. He saw Jesus walking. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was Jesus. I want to ask you a question. Who did John say that the Lamb of God would take away the sin of? The world. Not part of the world. The potential for every person to be saved is their choice. It's not God's choice. God's choice was to send Jesus. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so God loved the whole world. There's nobody that God does not want to save. Listen to, to, to the apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The apostle says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish, Peter. No, not a one. Therefore, the idea that there are certain people that are going to be lost and they have no choice in the matter, and their people are going to be saved and they have no choice in the matter is false. Here's the point. You can be saved if you want to. It's not God's problem. It's your problem. It's mine if I reject it. God's not willing that we perish that we should come to repentance. Paul said the same thing, basically, in 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6, that, that God want, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God so loved the world, yes. Uh, God's not willing that any should perish, that's right. That God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, yes. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 3. Jesus. Jesus spent his time with tax collectors and prostitutes, and they were some of the most despised people by the Jews in Jesus' day. Now, Jesus did not choose to spend time with them and neglect the Pharisees and the scribes, but the scribes and Pharisees weren't listening. They were stubborn. They were hard-hearted. They were spiritually blind. A lot of times people who have the most trouble in life are the ones that be first to listen. 
I remember some years ago, a man went to the prostitute section of a large city and was telling those people, you don't have to live like this. You can, you can be saved. God will forgive you. You don't have to live this way. That's what Jesus did. The woman at the well, it had five husbands. Jesus said, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. He said, I know that. You've had five and one you have now is not your husband. Why did Jesus talk to that woman of Samaria? Because he loved her. He wanted her to be saved. And you know, if you read the rest of the story in John chapter four, she became a believer in Christ and influenced other people to do it. God does not know a person that he does not want to be saved. God number four does not know a better way to save mankind than the plan that he has provided. Remember in John 1 29, good old John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. First Corinthians 15 and verse three, there's not a soul Jesus didn't die for. If Jesus had not died, if you go back and read Romans five verses six and eight, we're helpless. But you see, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ has paid the price for sin. If you go read Isaiah 53, one of the verses there talks about Jesus says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus paid the price. Now tell me he doesn't love you. Tell me he doesn't care. Yes, he does. The question is, will we believe his plan? The world can be saved through him. John 3 and verse 17. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other savior but Jesus. There's no other religion but Christianity. Some people say, I deny that. I, I challenge you to investigate it. Christianity is the only religion with an empty tomb of its founder. Jesus is in heaven. There's no other savior. There's no other acceptable sacrifice. Somebody says, well, okay, you've convinced me. God, there's a sin, no sin that God doesn't hate. There's no sinner that God does not love. There's no sinner that God does not want to be saved. And, and if there's no other plan, what is that plan? The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith, that's right. Where does faith come from? The word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't come from my emotions, my imagination, my heart. It comes from God. So we must hear God's word, we must believe it, and we must be obedient to it. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, the Bible says that he is the author or the source of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Now, how do we obey him? The Bible teaches us, and Jesus taught it. John the Baptist taught it. Jesus taught it. Peter taught it. Paul preached it to repent. That's a change of mind. You got to change your attitude toward God and Jesus and sin and decide, I don't want to live that way. I want God to forgive me. And so a classic example is Acts chapter two and verse 38. Those people had been charged with killing Jesus. Now, what worse crime could you come up with? I can't come up with a worse one. What are we going to do? They were cut to the heart after they were convinced that those Jewish people on Pentecost 50 days after Jesus was resurrected. They were cut to the heart when they realized that they had killed the wrong person. Jesus was the son of God. He was at God's right hand. He was the promised Messiah. And, and, and I'm trying to imagine when that hit them, people who had been looking for the Messiah for years, and, and the Bible says in Acts 2 and verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do? I don't think they said it as nice smoothly as I just did. They may have been 
What shall we do? What are we going to do? Repent, Peter said, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You mean, if we we already believe, yes, and you they confessed it in a way, what shall we do? Uh, confess Christ, which is part of God's plan, Romans 10, 9, and 10. What do we do? Repent and be baptized. What for? We already believe we don't need to be baptized. Oh, Peter says, yes, you do. What for? The remission or the forgiveness of your sins. Now, Jesus died for our sins. When do we receive the benefit of his blood in baptism? The Bible says that they needed to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And you know, some 3,000 people heard that sermon and obeyed it. There were far more people there in Jerusalem that heard that lesson. But 3,000 heard it, and they believed it, and they were baptized. And that day, the Lord added them to his church. Somebody said, well, well when do I need to do that? Well, when those people heard it on the day of Pentecost, they did it that day. It was immediate. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. Uh, bear with me for a moment as we wind this up. Follow me closely. You know, I've heard everything you've said, preacher, and, and I believe that. And one of these days I'm going to do this. How do you know? Well, because I'm planning to. How do you know that you'll see one of these days? How do you know that you will see bedtime tonight? How do you know that you'll even finish listening to this lesson? That's not a scare tactic. That's a reality. It happens every day. People pass from this life, and most of them pass without the word of God and without being prepared to stand before Jesus on the day of judgment. There's not a sin God does not hate. There's not a sinner he does not love. There's not a sinner that he does not want to see be saved. He does not have a different plan for salvation than what we've read. And he does not know a better time to be saved than right now. If somehow somebody could help you through this program, we would love to do it. May you please take this seriously. And remember, God loves you, but he wants you to do what he's asked you to do, to be a Christian. And you can. Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.